In our previous studies in this series, we have been dealing with the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we have devoted a certain measure of time to studying each one of them. The last gift that we dealt with was the gift of prophecy. And at the close of the previous study, I pointed out that the scripture clearly indicates that prophecy in the New Testament is to be subjected to scriptural judgment. In fact, it is unscriptural to admit prophesying in a New Testament congregation if it is not submitted to judgment. And in my opinion, on the basis of what I've seen over the years, I would say it would be better not to have prophesying at all than to have prophesying which is not checked or judged by scriptural standards. I want tonight to present to you briefly a, an outline of the various different standards of judgment which are presented for us for this purpose in the New Testament. I'd like to begin by pointing out certain general facts about prophecy in the New Testament. First of all, let's look in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. I only want to deal with the second half of the verse, but I'll read the entire verse. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. This is a verse that we dealt with already under the subject of tongues, uh, the particular function of tongues as a supernatural sign to unbelievers where a believer, by the Holy Spirit, speaks a language that he does not understand, but which is understood by an unbeliever present. And in this way, God brings supernatural conviction upon the unbeliever. This is not the regular use of tongues. This is an occasional and exceptional use. But in this way, by an unknown tongue, God speaks to unbelievers through believers. On the other hand, Paul says prophesying in the New Testament is not used by God to speak to unbelievers, but to believers. This is a very important basic fact, that prophesying in the New Testament congregation is used to speak to believers. And God does not speak to, unbeliever, to believers in the way that he might speak to unbelievers. I've heard from time to time prophesying that claimed to be by the Holy Spirit that was of uh, rebuke and condemnation and along that line which could have been appropriate for unbelievers but was not appropriate for believers. And uh, therefore it is very important we bear this in mind the primary purpose of prophesying in the New Testament congregation is to speak to believers, and God speaks to them as believers, not as unbelievers. In this respect, prophesying in the New Testament differs from prophesying in the Old Testament, where God often used his prophets to speak to, pe to people who were complete unbelievers. For instance, Elijah was used to deliver messages to men who made no real profession of faith, and Jeremiah was given messages that went to all the Gentile nations surrounding Israel. So in this respect, we have to observe a distinction between Old Testament prophesying and New Testament prophesying in the church, which is the body of Christ. New Testament prophesying is addressed to God's people, and the tone of it will always be appropriate to God's people. Then in 1 Corinthians 14.29, we have this further statement. And I've already, in previous studies, dealt with the distinction between the ministry of a prophet and the gift of prophesying, pointing out that the Bible says all may prophesy, but it does not say that all will have the ministry of prophets. So I cannot go back on that in this study again. Here we are dealing with the word prophets, possibly meaning the ministry of a prophet, or possibly meaning simply those that exercise the gift of prophesying. For our present purposes, it's not too important. But the scripture says, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. That's the King James Version, but the Greek there is plural, let the others judge. And by others, I understand the other prophets. This is another very significant fact about New Testament prophecy and New Testament prophets. They do not normally operate as individuals on their own. If you read the use of the word prophets in the New Testament, you'll find that it's always used in the plural, except in one particular place. And in that place, there is actually no exception, as the context indicates. In other words, prophets in the New Testament are part of the body of Christ. They function as members in the body. They're related to other members. They are not men acting on their own. Again, you have a man 
in the Old Testament like Elijah, who was a kind of rugged individualist standing out in the, against the background of apostasy and wickedness. He said, I only am left. As a matter of fact, the Lord had to correct him about that. But actually, he was functioning as the only mouthpiece of God at that time to the nation of Israel. But in the New Testament, this is not how the prophet operates. The New Testament concept is of a body with many members all operating together and in relationship to one another. And no one member can operate effectively merely on his own. This applies to the prophets. They are in groups. And when one is ministering, the others are exercising judgment or discernment. So Paul says, let the prophets speak, two or three at any one meeting, not everybody, and let the other prophets judge, or in the Greek, discern. And if you turn to Acts 11, verses 27 and 28, you'll find there what I take to be a typical New Testament exercise of the prophetic ministry. Acts chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Notice, the prophets came in a group. One of them was given the actual opportunity to minister and brought the message that God had, but it is clear that they, he was the representative of a group. He was not an individual operating on his own. And I believe that in the New Testament, or in this dispensation, Many have gone astray through exercising a prophetic ministry simply as an individual on their own. In fact, I've seen this happen. And in not a few cases, you'll actually find people more or less represent themselves as the sole mouthpiece of God to a certain group, a congregation or a prayer group or a church or whatever it may be. In my opinion, not nearly is that incorrect, but the whole attitude is totally contrary to the spirit of the New Testament. If you go a little further back in the history of the last few decades, you'll find that in what is called the Apostolic Church, which is a section of the Pentecostal movement, in every congregation they normally had the set prophet who appointed the set apostle. And these two individuals actually ran the congregation. Now, I'm not speaking to criticize the Apostolic movement, but as I understand Scripture today, that is totally alien to the whole spirit and purpose of the New Testament. And let me say this, and I'll probably repeat it la again later. There are no dictators in the body of Christ. And no gift and no ministry is intended to create any kind of dictatorship. There is a sharing together of ministry and of responsibility for that ministry. So that prophecy must be subjected to judgment. Not in the sense of picking it to pieces, but of discerning. Is it of God? Is it true? Is it really something that we have to give heed to, or is it not? This is brought out again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We are not to quench the Holy Spirit. We're not to refuse the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, as some people have done. And usually this comes about where there has been a misuse of spiritual gifts. For instance, I know a Pentecostal church in Britain where they have a sign on the wall in the main auditorium, no speaking in tongues except in the basement. Uh, this the reason being that speaking in tongues was so misused and overdone that they just couldn't cope with the problem, so they banished it to the basement. Well, that isn't really a scriptural solution. And there's a congregation here in the United States where now they only have messages in tongues on Thursdays. You may smile at that, but it's actually a fact and a very, very large, prominent congregation. Uh, this is not the scriptural way to solve the problem, but we have to recognize that the problem is real. So, quench not the Spirit. Don't give orders to the Holy Spirit not to turn up or manifest himself except on Thursdays or in the basement because that isn't really respectful to the Holy Spirit. Then it says, despise not Protestants. Why does it say that? Obviously, there could be situations where people would despise Protestants. And I have to say frankly, and I want to be careful how I say it, if the Bible didn't say, despise not Protestants, there would have been times when I would have despised Protestants. Because I've heard so many screwy, half-baked, useless 
utterances put forward under the guise of prophecy that actually there's a shield that comes up in me immediately now as soon as I hear anybody beginning to do what they claim to be prophesying I'm on my guard and I have to be careful that I don't become negative so I understand why Paul said despise not prophesying but the solution to the problem is not to quench the Holy Spirit it's not to despise prophesying generally it's found in verse 21 prove all things or test all things retain that which is good there's the answer and this is specifically in the context of, pro context of prophesying don't accept all prophesying without question as being from God or being relevant or being true or being authoritative test it and only retain that which is good what I always used to say to the Africans in Kenya about the missionaries was this not everything the missionaries have brought you is good some of what they brought you is good and some is far from good some of what you had before was better than what the missionaries brought you so I said don't accept everything the missionaries bring if you eat fish you know what to do swallow the flesh and spit out the bones and I say do the same with what the missionaries have brought swallow the flesh spit out the bones and I do the same with prophesying I swallow the flesh but I don't get, give myself indigestion trying to swallow the bones I spit them out sometimes it may not be too polite to spit them out but it's a lot better than swallowing bones and this I believe is good advice and again in 1st John chapter 4 the Apostle John returns to this theme 1st John chapter 4 verse 1 Beloved, believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of God the same word that's translated try there is the same one that's translated prove in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 test the spirits because many false prophets have gone out into the world you'll notice that a false prophet is one who has a false spirit actually you are not testing the prophet as an individual you're testing the spirit that is speaking through the prophet and we are warned that there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world having false spirits operating through them and a little further down in the same chapter chapter 4, 1 John, verse 6 the apostle draws the distinction between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error there is a spirit of error and it will seek sometimes to impart error in the guise of prophesying I have actually heard people sustain what I believe to be false doctrines by the exercise of prophesying and in fact it was very obvious that their whole purpose in prophesying was to get you to swallow a doctrine that they were trying to put across and this altogether again in my opinion is an unscriptural attitude towards prophesying now I want to go into the actual practical principles for judging prophesying each one of these could be the subject of a sermon I'm going to try to give you nine in the course of the remainder of this study nowadays if you go to a doctor and ask him what's the matter with you or are you well or are you sick it's uh, a well known fact that he will not just do as they used to do in the old days they put out your tongue it looks pink you're healthy or feel your pulse or even take your temperature he'll subject you to all sorts of tests related to different organs of the body and when he's been through every test he'll come up with his total diagnosis of what your condition is and I would say the same applies to judging prophecy you cannot accept just one or two tests there's a whole battery of tests and if you really want to be sure you should work through them and only form your judgment when you have been through a selection of different tests so I'm offering you nine tests let's begin with the first one and we'll turn to 1 Corinthians 14.3 1 Corinthians 14.3 he that prophesieth speaketh unto men edification and exhortation and comfort as I understand it this is a general statement of prophesying what does it do? it speaks to men and remember those men are believers what does it speak to them? edification exhortation and comfort none of these things are negative none are destructive none are condemnatory and whenever I hear a message that is condemnatory negative destructive I do not accept it as genuine New Testament prophesying because the limits are set there I, this has happened 
quite frequently. I always remember an occasion when I was preaching in a congregation in Chicago and I was on the platform waiting to speak on a Sunday morning and they were going through the song service which usually took about an hour with the announcements and all the rest and uh, in the beginning of one of the songs a man stood up somewhere near the back and started to do what he obviously wanted us to believe was prophesy in a rather harsh voice and the message that he brought had very little real meaning but what I could pick out of it was a general sense of condemnation and a warning of judgment hanging over people's heads well I sat down on the platform and boiled and did nothing about it and about two hymns later the man stood up and did the same this time I, I couldn't sit quiet any longer so I stood up while he was still prophesying got to the microphone and said I just want to tell you all that I do not accept this as a genuine manifestation of the gift of prophecy because the scripture says he that speaketh unto prophesy speaketh unto men edification, exhortation and comfort all I've heard and what our brother has said so far has been condemnation and confusion which are the exact opposites well that created something of a stir as you can imagine and after a little while another brother who also had the gift of prophecy stood up and he said I want to offer my opinion and he said I agree with brother Prince this was not genuine prophesying well then a third brother stood up on the other side and said the same and we had dealt with the situation in a scriptural way the others had judged they had given their unanimous verdict the man was squelched I thought he would never come back but as a matter of fact he came back next Sunday and behaved in a very much more respectful and decent way after that had settled down I said to the people there, I said, I want to tell you one main reason why I did what I did. In the two front rows, we had two complete rows of young people, teenagers and college students and so on. And I said, while that man was prophesying, I was looking at their faces. And their faces were registering one thing, this is phony. And I said, I just want to tell those young people I agree with them. It was phony. And I said, I have seen far too many young people turned off from the whole business to the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit through their elders and so-called betters trying to pretend that something that's wrong is right for the sake of being dignified and decent in church that I will not go along with it. And uh, generally speaking, I'll have to say that I believe I did the right thing in that situation. Normally, the religious thing would be either to try and sing the man down with choruses or at the end to say a past amen, praise the Lord, as if it was all right when it wasn't. And I don't believe that God is pleased with that. I, I believe that if we permit the exercise of prophesying, we have an obligation placed upon us by Scripture to have the operation of judging or discerning along with it. If we have no judgment and don't no discerning, let's have no prophesying. It's much better. It's too dangerous to have prophesying without judgment. It's like turning a young person loose in a, in, a, in a very fast sports car without checking the steering and the brakes. They'll end up in a wreck. And I, can have to, I would have to say, in the years, I've seen scores and scores of wrecks through the misuse of prophecy. I've seen homes broken up, churches divided, and people ruined financially and in other ways through the wrong use of prophecy. Prophecy is an extremely powerful instrument. And if it's misused, it can be misused to the destruction of people. Now we have to bear out that there is a time when God does rebuke and chasten. And there is a place for this, but it's never the ultimate. Just let's look for a moment in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10 as an example of this. In uh, verse 5 of Jeremiah chapter 1, the Lord says, I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. In verse 9, the Lord puts forth his hand, touches Jeremiah's mouth and says, I've put my words in thy mouth. This was his commission to be a prophet. Verse 10, the Lord says, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Notice there is a place for the negative, but the negative is never ultimate. There is a place for rooting out and pulling down those things which are not the planting of God. Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. But the ultimate purpose is planting. There is a place for destroying and throwing down. But the ultimate purpose is building. If we never come to the positive, 
then we are not moving with the Holy Spirit. The ultimate purposes of the Holy Spirit towards the people of God are always good. They're always positive. They're always to upbuild. In 2 Corinthians 10, 8 and 13, 10, we have this principle stated by Paul. We don't need to dwell on it, but let's look at it for a moment. 2 Corinthians 10, 8. Paul has had to use pretty stern language to the Corinthian church. And he has also had to assert his own authority, which was in question. But he says at, at the end of this, 2 Corinthians 10, 8, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. Notice, the authority given, by Paul, given to Paul as an apostle was for edification, not for destruction. And in First Corinth, and 2 Corinthians 13, 10, Paul says again, exactly parallel language. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord has given me, to edification and not to destruction. We have to bear this in mind, the ultimate purposes of God in the ministry of the gospel to the people of God are never for destruction. They are always for edification, for upbuilding. I think it's so important to learn this because I can look back on a time in my own ministry when I thought if I left people feeling miserable and guilty and condemned, I'd done a tremendous job. And I certainly succeeded, but it wasn't a tremendous job. And then God showed me that, that God never makes people feel guilty. If you're left feeling guilty, it's the devil that's done it. God never condemns his people. There's a great difference between condemnation and conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts, the devil condemns. Uh, conviction is specific. You told a lie. You stole money. You've got to take it back and apologize. It's never vague. It's never obscure. It always leaves you with something specific you have to do. Condemnation will be vague. You'll nail one of the devil's accusations. He comes up with two more. You nail them. He's got four more. Whenever you get into that area, you're outside the operation of the Holy Spirit. You're letting the devil play with you like a cat plays with a mouse. And unfortunately, it's often preachers or people who claim to minister that are doing this part of the devil's job for him. Now I must go on. The next test of prophecy is in relation to the scripture. This is very clear. We do not need to dwell on it, but it's very important. Second Timothy 3, 16 says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is given by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the authority behind all scripture is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit in all true prophecy is the Holy Spirit. And one thing is absolutely clear, the Holy Spirit will never contradict himself. In other words, anything given in prophecy will never be opposed to the letter or the spirit of Scripture. This is a vital fact. Let me give you one further Scripture along that line in Isaiah chapter 8. And these words of Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, are very, very applicable to today. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, that is what we would call in modern English, medium, and unto wizards, that's what we'd call fortune tellers or diviners, that peep and that mutter, should not a people speak unto their God? If you want the answer, do you need to go anywhere but to God? For the living to the dead, if you want to find the living, should you go to the dead for him? This is, speaks particularly about attempted communion with the dead, which is not a new thing, and which has always been under the curse of Almighty God from the time it was first manifested. Then here's God's answer to the law and to the testimony, to the written word of God. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Alternative translation, they are not to be sought unto. doesn't matter which way you translate it. The test is, do they speak according to the scripture? If not, then the spirit that is in them and speaks through them is not the Holy Spirit. And here, of course, is where Unfortunately, millions of people in modern America are going astray, doing the very, very thing that's warned against here. Seeking to mediums, seeking to communicate to the dead, going to fortune tellers. The basic reason is ignorance of the word of God. I've spoken to scores of people and told them, and they've often been professing Christians, 
Do you realize that if you'd done that under the law of Moses, you would have been put to death instantly? That's God's estimate of what you've been practicing. And some Christians are hard to convince. But there it is. The test is this. Does it agree with the letter and the spirit of Scripture? If not, it was not given by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1, 17 and 20 just says this. With God there is not yea and nay. God doesn't say yes in one mood and no in another. God actually has no moods. I know some people that try their, their prayer life is trying to catch God in another mood, but you'll never do that because that isn't the way he operates. The third test is their relationship to Jesus Christ. Turn, if you will, to John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. There's another specific characteristic of the Holy Spirit. He always glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. It is true that he will reveal us things to come, but he'll always do it in the context of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people today whose names are well known. One lady who's associated with a book on prophecy, that I don't want to name her, and I'm in no sense reviling her or criticizing her, but in actual fact she claims to be able to show things to come, and you read the whole of her book without one reference to Jesus Christ or without one sentence that exalts Jesus Christ. See, it does not pass the test of being the Spirit of God. It is, in actual fact, precisely what the scripture calls the spirit of divination which can also give supernatural revelation concerning the future in a measure so whenever anybody comes to you with any kind of revelation or new doctrine or prophecy what is the attitude to the Lord Jesus Christ do they exalt him do they glorify him do they give him the preeminence which is due to him alone Revelation 19.10 takes this thing, I think, even one step further. John says, I fell at his feet, the feet of the angel, to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that had the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit in all prophecy, from the first prophecy ever given to the last prophecy that will ever be given, sent us in testifying to Jesus Christ. And anything that departs from testifying to and exalting Jesus Christ is not given by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are various different things that people will put in the place of Jesus. Some will put a human personality, a teacher, a preacher. Some will put a denomination or a group or their particular church. I was invited, at least I wasn't invited, I was... Uh, I don't know how I would say, enticed into preaching in a certain congregation once here in the United States. They will remain nameless and unspecified. They never invited preachers uh, because they left the meeting open to God and they didn't exalt any human personality. But they indicated to me if I turned up on a certain night they'd ask me to preach, which is as close to inviting a person as, as you can come without doing it. Well, personally, I don't go for that kind of, what should I say, sham anyhow. And they certainly didn't exalt the human personality, but what they did from the beginning to the end of the meeting was exalt their own particular setup, congregation, and mode of doing things. And really, I would have been happy to listen to them exalting a preacher just for a change. So it isn't always a person, it isn't always a denomination, it can be their particular group. And you will find in the United States today not a few groups that have that problem. I tell people, if you ever meet a group that says, if you want to be right, you must join us. You can be sure of one thing, when you've joined them, you're wrong. Because any group that has that spirit is wrong to start with. Now, in Colossians 1.18, you have this further statement that in all things, Jesus should have the preeminence. And that is indeed true of prophecy. 